Moses, Messiah, and trusting faith. This is from Parsha Shemot, the beginning of Exodus. I'd like to tell you a personal story and how it relates to the story of Exodus. I was raised as a reformed Jewish boy and teenager. And then I came to believe in Yeshua at 18 years old. And it was a form of exodus. I left Reform Judaism and thought I was going to a different faith. I did not realize that I was not leaving the Hebrew faith. I was going from one form of Judaism to another form of Judaism. And the Lord spoke to me early on, but it took a long time for me to learn. You see, the tree of life has roots in the earth and branches up to the sky, but I didn't realize it. I was rejecting the roots of the tree of life. As it says, um, its ways are ways of pleasantness, the Torah, and all its paths are shalom. She is a tree of life to those who will lay hold on her, and happy are those who hold her fast. So, in the beginning, I rejected the roots, but it turned out to be a blessing. You see, God is in the, the habit of turning curses into blessings. And in my search to find my roots, I can come here today and I learned about the roots. And I learned a great deal because I had realized that I need to be healed. If you are a Jew or a non-Jew, when you have Messiah, when you embrace Messianic Judaism or Messianism, you can be healed. The word shalom does not only mean peace. It means wellness and fullness. And the Hebrew word for healing is refuah. He can, God will heal you as you come to understand the roots of the faith. Exodus. We all have our exit. Most of us have Exodus stories. Those who believe in Yeshua have Exodus stories of going out. But he is leading us to the promised land. Let's talk about the word Exodus. It means going out. A title derived from the Greek translation of the rabbinical name of the book, Sefer Yetziat Mitzrayim, which says the book of the going out from Egypt. In the Hebrew Bible, this book is called Shemot, names following the custom of naming a book according to its significant word, its first significant word. Parashot Shemot, the first portion of the book, begins directly where Genesis left off by listing the names of the descendants of Jacob who came to Egypt to live in the land of Goshen. These are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, every man coming with his household. That's Exodus 1 1. Ah. Uh, what happened was, then Moses was born. Ah, uh, Moses was born, and at 40 years old, he comes, he sees two Israelite Hebrews fighting, and he says, why, why are you two fighting? And he says, oh, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? When Pharaoh heard about the affair, he took steps to have Moses put to death. Moses fled from Pharaoh 
and ended up in the land of Midian. Ironically, the same Midianites who sold Joseph to Egypt now sheltered the one who would lead his people out of Egypt. Midian was northeast of the Gulf of Aqaba, and therefore Moses fled along the trade route that crossed the Sinai Peninsula, a distance of some 250 miles. Now let's talk more about Moses and the Messiah Yeshua. Every day during the last half year before he died, Reb Menachem Mendel, born 1789 to 1866, used to open up a volume of Midrash Rabbah and read a certain passage to his son, Reb Shemuel, who later succeeded him as Rebbe, Rebbe of Chabad Lubavitch. Lubavitch. The passage runs as follows. And Joseph and all his brothers died, and all that generation. Though Joseph and his brothers died, their God did not die. The story of the Exodus lays the pattern for redemption. Moses prefigures Messiah. There's a direct parallel between Herod's slaughter of the innocents in Matthew chapter 2 and the Jewish legends surrounding Moses' birth narrative. Moses was born under Pharaoh's decree to cast the male children into the Nile. According to the Midrash, Pharaoh's astrologers foresaw the birth of Moses. Like the astrologers of Matthew 2, the astrologers of Egypt read in the stars that the Redeemer of Israel was about to be born. The astrologers told Pharaoh, the mother of Israel's savior is already pregnant with him. When the astrologers told Pharaoh that Israel's redeemer was about to be born, Pharaoh issued the decree to have all the male babies cast into the river. Jewish literature cast Messiah in the pattern of Moses. The life and ministry of Moses served as a messianic prototype, which the ultimate Messiah, Messiah is expected to reflect. The Midrash often refers to Moses and Messiah, respectively, as the first redeemer and the ultimate redeemer. As a prophet like Moses, the life and work of Messiah must reflect the pattern set by Moses. The, Mid the Midrash clearly states the future Redeemer will be like the former Redeemer. Uh, Ruth Rabbah 5 verse 6. The parallels between the life and ministry of Moses and Yeshua are not limited to their birth narratives. And as the story of the Torah continues, we take note of the many ways in which the first Redeemer sets the pattern for the ultimate Redeemer. Acts chapter 7, Stephen, he's standing before the Sanhedrin. He recounts, the story of Moses. As the time drew near for the fulfillment of the promise God had made to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt increased greatly until there arose another king over Egypt who had no knowledge of Yosef. With cruel cunning, 
this man forced our fathers to put their newborn babies outside their homes so that they would not survive. It was then that Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. For three months he was reared in his father's house. And when he was put out of his home, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. So Moses, trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, became both a powerful speaker and a man of action. But when he was 40 years old, the thought came to him to visit his brothers, the people of Israel. On seeing one of them being mistreated, he went to his defense and took revenge by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed his brothers would understand that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't understand. When he appeared the next day as they were fighting and tried to make peace between them by saying, Men, you're brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? The one who was mistreating his fellow pushed Moses away and said, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me the way you killed that Egyptian yesterday? On hearing this, Moses fled the country and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. After 40 more years, an angel appeared to him in the desert near Mount Sinai in the flames of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw this, he was amazed at the sight, and as he approached to get a better look, there came the voice of Adonai. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But Moses trembled with fear and didn't dare to look. Moses said to him, take off your sandals because the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have seen how my people are being oppressed in Egypt. I have heard their cry, and I have come down to rescue them, and now I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and judge, is the very one whom God sent as both ruler and ransomer by means of the angel that appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out performing miracles and signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. This is the man who is in the assembly in the wilderness, accompanied by the angel that had spoken to him at Mount Sinai, and by our fathers, the man who was given living words to pass on to us. Just as Joseph, his story foreshadowed Messiah's redemption, so too the Moses story foreshadows the drama of Yeshua. Yet, we must not, we must beware of not becoming so intoxicated with the messianic interpretation that we lose sight of the story of Exodus. Exodus and the events of Moses' life are not an allegory meant only to prefigure Yeshua. Instead, they are a real history about real people who experienced a genuine salvation. The similarity between the Exodus story and gospel story is simply the same, the result of the same God orchestrating the redemption. This is what it looks like 
when God redeems his people. This is what it looks like when God raises up a redeemer. Now, let's talk about Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian who with her father and other family members helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. Her family was arrested due to an informant in 1944 and her father died 10 days later at Scheveningen prison. A sister, brother, and nephew were released. But Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp where Betsy died. Corey wrote many books and spoke frequently in the post-war years about her experiences. She also aided Holocaust survivors in the Netherlands. Her autobiography, The Hiding Place, 1971, was later adapted as a film of the same name in 1975. I'll hear a few quotes by Corey Ten Boom. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling down a center of fear. Worry does not empty today, tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. See, we see the, the principle of healing here. When a